Sacred and Terrible Air by Robert Kurvitz Narrated by Thomas Franklin My heart will not rest until it rests in you. St. Augustine Chapter 1 Charlotte's Y'all This summer resort near Vasa swallowed up four looned girls along with their small bones and sun-bathed skins, an entire era vanished. Six kilometers of winding coastline, a popular swimming spot in the fifties, rows of changing cabins, high reeds rustling in the winds. There you can find the era conservatives mourn, back when parents could send their kids to the beach unsupervised with two real for ice cream and bus fare in their summer short pockets worriedly shaking their heads and hiding the news from Messina, Grad, and Gottwald, where, so it seemed to them, every week tiny skeletons were found cast into someone's furnace. Every week someone's daughter, who had been kept in the basement for thirty years, escaped into the street and cried out for help. But not here. Here there is social democracy, and the soft peach blossoms of social democracy its gentle social programs, from these progressive things the broken soul of man starts to feel good. This strange technical urge to construct a secret underground room will never reach these outskirts. Here we have a ventilation system, whose openings on the garden lawn are disguised as miniature clay windmills. Those dark, feverish fits of the mind, they cool down in the chilly mist of the outskirts the breath of distant blue glaciers. It freezes those sick thoughts in a man's head. Vasa, you'd rather live there. And then, one Tuesday morning, when there are white clouds in the blue sky, four sisters, Madge, five, Ani Aelin, twelve, Malin, thirteen, and Charlotte Lund, fourteen, go to the beach to swim together, they take two real in cash, four pairs of swimming clothes, food and drinks, and two large towels in two beach bags. At 9.30 a.m., they board the horse-drawn tram to La Visa, a suburb of Vasa. The tram driver remembers them well. Today, twenty years later, it is the highlight of the day for Roland, who lives in a nursing home, when he can talk about it. The eldest bought tickets for everyone. To Charlotte's, y'all. Forty cents. Ten cents per ticket. If they had gone even one stop further, it would have been twenty cents per ticket. But my goodness, what a beautiful girl. So polite, too. The oldest one, Charlotte. The old man rattles rhythmically. I didn't know it yet. I read it in the newspaper later. And then I went straight to the police, without delay, every second counted. At 10.25 a.m., the girls got off at Charlotte's Yall Beach. They thanked the tram driver one by one, as they are good children. It's hot on the beach that morning, and there are only a few people. The girls then meet Agnetha, the ice cream shop saleswoman. Agnetha is still a student twenty years ago and works in an ice cream shop for her summer job. Malin and Annie Aylin buy four ice creams, two vanilla, one lime, and one chocolate. The rest of the girls can't be seen. The blinds are drawn to block out the sun, and the only uncovered window is next to the counter, presenting a commercial display. On a weekday morning, the clientele is sparse. Young Agnetha knows the girls and their well-established taste preferences. Peppermint, Malin's favorite, is not available on that day, and thus a little confusion arises. Unexpectedly, in addition to ice cream, the girls also buy three meat pies in oil batter. This brings the bill to one real and fifty cents. The girls exit the store, and Agnetha notices a man in their company from the uncovered window next to the counter. There's nothing more Agnetha can remember about the man. Age, height, clothing, whether there was more than one man, or, as Agnetha would later wonder, if there even was a man. 
this is the last time the girls are ever seen again. The four daughters of Anne Margaret, who had been sworn in as Minister of Education two days ago, and a paper manufacturer, Carl Lund, disappear. The press starts a years-long love affair with the case. Every detail is brought out in newspaper columns, and thus the Lund girls are brought deep into the memory of the nation. The disappearance story itself became one of the most prestigious unsolved cases across the Real Belt. At about 12.40, five hours and twenty minutes before six o'clock, when the girls are expected home, and about thirty minutes before the ice cream shop, three boys are sitting in the living room. The sun is shining through the strip curtains, making the room look golden. The boys are classmates for two of the sisters. The tall, freckled boy is holding a phone to his ear. Come on, call already, do it! urges the blonde boy from behind. Well, it doesn't make a great impression if I call like three hours before we agreed. The fat Il Mara immigrant pulls on the sleeve of the tall boy. Really, Therese, call! Something's wrong! I know, I know, says Therese, and the steel dial rings under his finger. The horrible noise of time approaches, the most violent sound in the world. There is no longer a golden light that falls on the room, but a very deep pale. All the distances there are insurmountable. There is a horror vacui between every object and the next. Chapter 2 Class Reunion Inayat Khan pours himself a glass of moors. A drop of pink liquid drips from his chin onto his tie. The suit fits poorly and the buttons tear. It gives off the impression that he's an idiot. A fat idiot with a bright blue tie, he thinks. I shouldn't have come. Go on, see your friends. Who were they again? That von Fersen, he was a nice guy and he wasn't my friend. He was a psychoterrorist. I despised him, that little arrogant upstart. He's grown up to be an esteemed man now. He's grown up to be a ruthless careerist, a vile guy, a racist, too. I remember what he called me. Do you want me to tell you what he called me, mother? And Therese and Jesper. Jesper is also well known now. Camel shit, mum. He called me camel shit. Khan watches the magnetic tape slide across the reader. The plastic discs rotate in the machine in a mesmerizing way, the magnet becoming music, a slow song, and for a moment it seems as if the dots of light are creeping across the wall and floor of the auditorium again, like stars in the sky or a swarm of jellyfish deep underwater. The dots of light dance on Malin Lund's white dress, and his hand starts to feel sweaty on the girl's waist. What do you say? Time stands still, the music fades, and Malin Lun's dark green eyes are reflected in Khan's thick-framed dialectical materialist glasses. Ah, uh, a woman probably from a parallel class stops next to the man. She starts to say something, but then pretends to reach for a snack. Neither of them came. Khan is alone, and the woman in a pantsuit is in a pantsuit. Can't just stand around, either. Have to manage somehow. He pulls a magic pen out of his pocket. There, beneath the glass, Supermat Nezinski, chairman of the Presidium of the People's Republic of Samara, smiles his hearty historical black-and-white smile straight into the camera. To his left, a man with a rat's face is leaning on the railing of the boat, wearing a black leather coat from the secret police force. Behold the elusive commissar! Khan says and flips the pen. The man with the rat's face disappears under the glass. Only the chairman of the presidium, Supermat Nizinski himself, together with Otomsky, a groveler, who is exceptionally adept at giving embarrassing criticisms, remains. Where there used to be a commissar, there is now an empty reeling. You can now see the part of the bridge that was behind the commissar before. Very interesting, says the woman in a pantsuit, and looks searchingly over her shoulder. Khan wipes away a piece of hair stuck to his forehead. In his other hand, 
he still holds a pen, which he now looks at with an oblivious smile, muttering to himself, There is a commissar, there is no commissar. The smile flickers for a moment, and then disappears from the man's double-chinned face. Khan's big, sad eyes watch the hustle and bustle of grown-ups in the lobby. The promotion of fifty-six is calling out for each other. Handshakes are exchanged, and children's pictures and wallets are shown. There is a commissar. There is no commissar. A man in his thirties sits on the parquet floor in a spacious room. The parquet is freshly varnished, the interior designer's blonde hair falling over his brow. He sits with his legs crossed and his fine white hands clasped. When the man looks up, the room's interior is reflected back at him from the floor-to-ceiling windows. Behind him, in the dim light, the skeletal minimalism of the designer furniture, the stone countertop kitchenette, and two analog speakers stood out like dark obelisks. A solitary spirit looms over the room. A beige Perseus black overcoat hangs on its stand, and a shoe rack holds white suede shoes worth three thousand real. His hand is on the dimmer switch, and the light fades. The room's reflection disappears, and outside the floor-to-ceiling window, a sea of ferns begins. The dark green glow fades into the darkness beneath the fir trees. Usually, he sits here listening to music, but tonight it's so quiet you can hear the rain pattering on the ferns. Jesper de la Gardie also did a lot of nose candy in his twenties, when he and his fellow thinkers developed the world-famous Ildad Minimal design language. Then they scurried together between the Café of the Union of Architects and the restrooms of a prestigious interior design office, congratulated each other on inventing the future, and sipped on bottled water. This project we are making, it rules! Through the language of images, we will define human visual cognition for the next century. And one day, I will write a book about it. Tasteless people are wicked people. Evil is tasteless. Is it really so inconceivable, then, that simple, clean interior design will make the world a better place? Then, nose candy went out of fashion, but bottled water stayed. Jesper takes a sip and stands up, adjusts the tie of his V-neck sweater, lifts the phone from the hook, and calls a taxi. The lights of the concrete cube beneath the fir trees go out as the machine takes off with Jesper into the dark woods, leaving behind a cloud of burnt fuel. In the empty house, a telephone rings between the glass walls, a white device on a wooden cube table with an exceptionally beautiful appearance. It's dark. International Collaboration Police Agent Therese Machahek steps off the train in Magnesium Hall. The steadily intensifying rain makes the steel monoliths of the carriages shine. There they tower, suspended by a rope railing in the sky above the platform. Steam rises from underneath the wagons, from hot magnets and drifts below in billowing clouds on the asphalt of the platform. Machahek takes his suitcases from the conductor and moves with the crowd into the train station building. A coin drops into the metal slot of the payphone. The ringing tone calls and the International Collaboration Police Agent practices saying, Hello, normally and relaxed, while holding the phone. The freckles on his cheeks and the bridge of his nose have faded completely with time, his face a permanent frown. No one answers. The man takes the address from his briefcase along with directions and decides on the tram. The dark shape of the magnesium hall towers over the city. Luminous elevator cabins descend from its belly to Vasa like dandelion umbrellas. In one of them, Agent Machahek watches as the only metropolis of the Nordic countries glows beneath his feet. The elevator window is dripping with rain and in the distance, the low, flat city in the North Sea dissolves into an archipelago of light. Telefunken's slender mast alone rises from the saturnine green mass of the buildings. Motorcycles meander there, glowing golden 
and traffic on cycles is as smooth as a dream. There is Königsmalm, a commercial center, and directly below lies Salem, where the colorful lights of the immigrant district flow on the asphalt. Horse-drawn trams emerge from under the canopy of the Menege, climb the slopes, and disappear with a clatter under shiny green chestnuts. The tracks scatter among Lovisa's tens and hundreds of parks, leading to university islands and social housing estates where the city quietly gives way to coniferous forests. Far away in the suburbs, the lights go out, and Machahek feels the summer resorts, empty beaches, and pine forests shivering in the rain. From there, the real Katla begins, and over its dark ridges, clear cuts, and valleys, the frozen winds approach from behind winter's orbit already by the end of September. Chestnut leaves swirl under the canopy of the Manege building into the waiting pavilion, where a girl with a baby voice announces route numbers and delays through a loudspeaker. The structure's framework echoes back at her. Leaves are sticking to the glass of the pavilion and the windows of the horse-drawn trams, and the air is filled with the smell of their manure. A collaboration police agent steps into the crowded carriage with a briefcase in hand. On top of the briefcase, the contours of the isolas, the emblem of the collaboration police, take flight like a soaring bird of prey. Chestnut trees in front of the gymnasium sway in the wind. Leaves fly onto the stairs, sidewalks, and mud puddles. The surface of the water shimmers as the car comes to a screeching halt. The taxi door closes, and then a pair of white suede shoes worth 3,000 reals step into the puddle. The interior designer curses as he takes three long steps away from the puddle. Angrily accepting the splashes of mud on his shoes, he puts the briefcase under his arm and walks up the stairs to the lobby. It's warm inside. It smells like glue. Jesper walks through the lobby, the worn parquet floor creaking under his shoes. He takes the name tag from the smiling volunteer and puts it in the back pocket of his trousers. You should put it on your chest. They are for everyone to recognize each other. Yes, says Jesper, and leaves the label in his pocket. Portraits from the yearbook and class photos are lined up on the stand. 8B. A short blonde boy with a head too big for his shoulders and a lock of hair combed behind his ear. To the left is an overweight Ilmara immigrant child wearing an ill-fitting tie. Little Khan stares blurrily past the camera. The tall, freckled Koiko in the back row of lanklets suggested he take off his glasses, so as to look less lame. Slowly, the man's gaze moves along the 8B rows, anxiety growing in his heart. His imagination precedes him. Somewhere in the middle of the girl's row, a massive cluster of hydrogen fusion reactions, a distant constellation of matter, shines. It was eight years ago when Jesper's sharp sketch first appeared on the glossy paper cover of a design booklet. Admittedly, Spotlight had to be shared with two other coked-up visionaries. There they were, the three of them on a photo shoot, sitting on their flagship sofa. The softbox was diffusing, Fockengoff was playing, and underneath it all was written, Pioneers, the future, sophisticated, and much more, all of which he remembers very well. Two hours later, Jesper sat alone in his glowing cube, scrunchy in hand, on a morbidly large stack of classroom photos and newspaper cuttings. One glance at the spruce trees swaying in the wind and the temptation to take another look to see if the smell had worn off was overcome. The scrunchie was sorted into the household waste box and the girl's folder into packaging. Jesper stood in the middle of the room and exhaled deeply. Enough. It's over now. But where are they? Why aren't they here? Why are neither of them here? Disappointed, Jesper is already taking a step back to look over all the pictures properly, when suddenly a 34-year-old man stops in the middle of the lobby. This man still lives with his mother. Early spring, 20 years ago. Little Inayat Khan falls headfirst into a mud puddle 
covered with a thin layer of ice. His woolen reindeer sweater is muddy, and dark red blood drips from his nose. Despite the many warnings and worried suggestions to stay on the ground, the boy manages to get up, slowly and unsteadily, falling down once again. Finally, he stands face to face with Sven von Fersen, just a few meters away. The mud dries on little Khan's face, his hands rise in an awkward battle stance, his fists shake with anger and humiliation. Hey, do you know what he said? Von Fersen starts again. The despicable little lackey knows what Khan said, but still asks. Tell me, what did he say, Sven? Sven is not stingy with his answer. He walked little Malin home and kissed her. Can you believe it? Khan the leech took her home. Leechy Khan kissed her. Laughter echoes, and the lackey quickly chimes in. Why do you have to talk such hurtful nonsense? It's your own fault. If you talk such hurtful nonsense, it's your own fault. Do you think it's nice for Malin to hear such hurtful nonsense? Huh? Is it? Tears of anger draw lines on the cheeks of the boy with a reindeer sweater. Yesterday after school, Khan let his imagination run wild. It was a terrible mistake. The sun comes out from behind a cloud, and he already sees, from the spectator's circle some tens of meters away, how Malin Lun's blonde hair shines like a halo. The girl blushes with shame. Charlotte, the oldest of the sisters, puts her hand on Malin's shoulders and they turn their spring-jacketed backs. Don't you think your sweater should have some, I don't know, camels on it? A shout rings out like a curved sword through the schoolyard as Khan lunges desperately towards von Fersen. Though he slips a bit, in his mind he still sees how the sharp spear of Amistad's epic hero, Ramut Karzai, pierces the enemy's chest. The distance shrinks, and an animalistic collision seems inevitable. But suddenly... From the corner of his eye, he sees an unknown factor that stops him. The other hand held up like a stop sign against von Fersen's stiff chest. With outstretched arms, Jesper, a blonde lock on his forehead, spits out his gum and unleashes a barrage of Who cares, Sven? Don't stop fucking around! arguments. Khan tries to break free from his deskmate's grip, his scratched cheek and bloody nose smearing Jesper's shoulder. So they stand. The bell rings and the lunch break is over. The courtyard empties of children, and Jesper wipes his shoulder with a napkin. So, did you kiss Malin? he asks. No, but I did walk her home, and it went well, very well. Except it didn't go that well. Yeah. That's the same shirt. Tell me, Khan, that it's not the same shirt. Jesper! Two adults stand in a cloakroom and shake hands for the first time in years. Jesper's flickering smile carries a hint of warmth. He begins, I think I behaved a little rudely last time we saw each other. I understand now. It was a mistake. Khan simply laughs in response. His two-day-old stubble wobbles along with his friendly double chin. I left an ignorant impression on you. Having said that, Jesper pauses for a moment to think about what he has planned next. I have news. Something new. He points to his folder and looks at Khan questioningly. Or oh, have you, I don't know, become a chef in the meantime? You know, I'm always hardcore. Without even a hint of class reunion, Khan takes his jacket from the dressing room and they head towards the door. Look, a disappearing commissioner. It's not so bad. I made one for Therese, too. It's a special version. The same picture, but guess what happens if you turn it a little further? What happens? Otomsky disappears too. One pigeon too. It's partly behind Otomsky. Otherwise, half a pigeon would be left hanging in the air. Exactly. Drops of rain fall from Agent Machahek's umbrella, and a puff of smoke floats in the shadow of the umbrella and then disappears into the wind. With his Astra in mouth, the man folds the map and puts it in his briefcase. In front of him is the high school lawn where two men run through a silver rain curtain towards him. The Koiko takes a step back in his grained fishbone pattern coat. He makes room under the umbrella. It's enormous. It's standard issue for the collaboration police. Did he apologize? He apologized, Khan replies for Jesper. Is it nice there? Machahek points towards the school building. 
Khan shakes his head, and Jesper elaborates. Let's go to the city instead. There's one place, one new place. The three men under the large umbrella walk until they can't be seen anymore. The distant chiming of bells draws closer as the silver curtains are pulled together behind the friends' backs. Eight years ago. Until the stereo 8 format tape clicks against the magnetic reader, needles under little lamps hitting 12 decibels. The beat is unbearably smooth, even more modern than nose candy. Or who knows, it's hard to say. The beat comes from here, from the world-famous Vasa Recording Studios. The beat was made by someone semi-mythical, Fakengoff, who may be an Oranier's immigrant, a DJ, and a music producer, but is rather a group of people or a machine in the sky. The nose candy, however, came from a pirate ship through the uncharted pale. The nose candy was made by a slave dreaming of revolution and an overseer guarding the fields with a rifle. Fockengoff made the beat so that the girls would start dancing and the boys would have a good view. The slave with machetes made the nose candy so that La Puta Madre wouldn't send his family to the firing squad. For six months, the nose candy matured in the Irmala High Mountain Plateau in the golden rays of the sun. The world eagle, with its thousand-kilometer wings, kept the sun from falling from the turquoise blue sky. The place where the beat seems to go underwater for half a minute and then comes back, even more amazing than it sounds. Fakengaf, whispered to the spirit of debauchery. He had angelic white wings, but his breath next to the ear of the DJ crouched behind the mixing console was hot, smelling of cinnamon and primal malice. My God, what a lovely numbness in the nose! My God, how good is that place where the beat comes out of the water! So sad, even fiercer than before! How cool am I? I'm on the cover there, it's so cool on the cover there. I'm a pillar of light, vertical, and there's a dark room around me. And that's it. That's all there is, you see? The guests on Jesper's white cube sofa and behind the multifunctional table exchange impressions of the world exhibition. Champagne socialist goblets are also clinked. Jesper alone, dancing like a rare albino rooster. From the water bottle in his right hand, Pearly drops fly to the windows. Like times that have already been and gone, the streets of Vasa drift by the taxi window. A large black horse clenches its teeth, its breath rising from its nostrils. Something sweet sweeps into the shattered heart of the collaboration police agent. The rain subsides, and young people slowly fold their umbrellas in the darkness. Metro entrances, familiar place names. A girl on a bicycle turns towards a side street where the yellow streetlights are streaming. Traffic reflects from the windows of buildings and closed shops until a motorway rises above the sidewalks. The passing city flashes through the cracks of the stone edges, and a little boy waves to Machahek from the window of a passing car. On Königsmalm Bridge, the passing streetlights become a dotted line, the gray silhouette of the prestigious residential area towers over the water, where Therese's home was when he lived in Vasa as a child. Ahead, behind the windshield of the carriage, begins the island district that had a dubious reputation twenty years ago. As Jesper explains now, careful development work and some groundbreaking galleries have made it the next trend area after Erstelmam. Bourgeois bohemian, you mean? The taxi meter ticks. It's warm and dark inside. Jesper doesn't even acknowledge Teresa's witty comment. Hey, talk then! Khan changes the mixed topic of urban development and class reunion suddenly. I need a projector. There's also a tape. I'll talk when we arrive at Cafe Cinema. But show us the scrunchie! Therese joins in with the begging. Come on, don't start. I don't carry it with me. I threw it away. It was a very weird time altogether. A cunning smile appears on Khan's face. Jesper, don't be a spoil sport. Jesper looks out the window. No. A silent moment passes. The hum of wheels on the road, the clicking of a turn signal. 
Khan and Therese look at each other, chuckling, and Jesper pretends to be indifferent, looking out the window. Only a little later does he feel the obligation to pick up the conversation again. What did you tell Fersen? The detective story? Scrunchy, Jesper, the scrunchy. Show it. In a resigned manner, the interior designer reaches into his Perseus black overcoat and takes out a ring box. Everything was so good, and now it's so sad. Talking about funk, aesthetics, and futurism with a young real estate developer's photographer wife under the window. There was a feeling that everything was going to be like this from now on, that normalcy would never return. But now, the woman singing through the monolith loudspeaker says 10,000 times in a row that she's in love, in love, in love. Outside the window, the morning gray sinks through the ferns, cold and damp. It doesn't feel like that anymore, that the song is about Jesper. Now it's just some singer in the studio. Maybe I should do it again. I just did it, and it didn't feel any better. I don't know. Maybe I should still do it. A minute later, in the milky gray light in the center of the room, stands a newly 26-year-old version of Jesper de la Gardie, who has just stepped up to a higher league. His coffee-colored shirt is unbuttoned, his nostrils are red, and his mouth is set in an angry sneer. So, the party's over. Go home. No one hears him. Vakengoff is too loud. With the stop button of the stereo 8 format tape player under his finger, the pillar suddenly falls silent in the middle of the light. Heads turn. Party's over. Back home, you filth. Jesper's glassy eyes and monstrously disdainful mouth droop as clothes and handbags are awkwardly searched for. A pat on the shoulder from a fellow visionary earns him a look that can forever ruin human relationships. The real estate developer's photographer wife falls slightly behind the group in front of the house and then returns to the concrete cube. Anklet, she lies. Long legs in strapped sandals, a silver chain around her ankle frame the next sad sight. Jesper sits amidst the scattered garbage sorting bags in the kitchen corner. He looks up at the kind face of the real estate developer's wife amidst the apple cores, empty water bottles, and handmade paper bags of pasta. The foggy September beats reflected in his eyes indicates that Jesper is not interested. Your condolences? No thank you. The high reeds rustle in the wind, and the silhouettes of changing cabins stand in line under the gray-white sky. Four girls run across the sand and disappear into thin air. In his right hand, the interior designer holds a light pink scrunchie. Khan looks up at Jesper, a ring box in his hand under his nose. His eyebrows are furrowed. He is worried. The car jolts when it stops. The taxi driver sticks his head into the cabin, but quickly turns away after seeing the expressions on the faces of the men. The smell is gone, Khan says. I know. There's something very wrong with it. I know. Chapter 3 Non-Entity The Roman Garad Conference distinguishes between ten different types of missing people. The ninth of them, Non-Entity, is a flagrant violation of the International Bill of Human Rights. Such a person has not only been eliminated by a state's organ of violence, but the documentation of his or her former existence has also been lost. This particular case of political fading, the cursing of memory, has been inflicted on a number of historical figures with varying degrees of success. In the case of Mesk, for example, a loss of as much as 10% of the historical scale of the entire culture can be statistically established. We can't dwell on these successful examples. It would be impossible to talk about a day that did not happen. But small signs are left behind of all of us, and the censor is also human. Thus, it may happen that the citizen erased is, thanks to their non-entity, a considerably more recognized historical figure than their colleague who was simply shot in the head behind a dumpster. What other prominent narrative could have saved the Samara Communist Party cutthroat Julius Kuznitsky, 
from the obscurity of history, if not for this funny photo. As the recording techniques develop, even more complicated processes have been added to the former craft of filing the emperor's head off coins. For a well-oiled degenerate bureaucratic country of workers, a little spring cleaning of the punched cards is not much of a challenge. But in the photographic age, and in some particularly curious examples in the film age, cleaning takes on a certain technical subtlety. One that we can already admire is the case of the aforementioned disappearing Commissar Julius Kuznitsky, who was made to disappear by the photo retoucher's magic wand on board the steamboat Mazov on that gloomy Sunday morning. Julius was a disgusting man, an uneducated hick. His eyes did not see the world revolution. The commissar's stellar flight began later in Samara. Without having the slightest imagination of Mazov's idea, however, he did not think much of giving the victims titles with politically incriminating connotations. This was his undoing in the end. Apparently, one day, the chairman of the bureau, Mr. Nezinsky, simply could not bear the embarrassment any longer. Tell me, Kuznia, how can it be that Comrade Zdrov is a counter-revolutionary when the revolution was fifty years ago? And why are Comrade Broski's Lenzovlik Nienskiist beliefs irreversibly narrow-minded? I am Nienzinsky, Sapurmats Nienzinsky, that is my name. In some circles, the two images, the original and the retouching, have become a popular cultural phenomenon. The rat smile that Kunznitsky wore on his face that day adds a spiritual value to the curiosity. Just look at him. Who wouldn't want to wipe this foul weasel from the existence of history? Much sadder is the story of the third figure in that same fateful photo. Aram Otomsky, Mazov's loyal revolutionary friend from the 11-day government. An outstandingly talented agronomist, geneticist, and one of the three breeders of the Ulan yellow potato. An extraordinarily apolitical figure whose unpretentious behavior and indispensable contributions to the diet of the world's working classes saved him from a total of three dismissals. That is, until Otomsky's scientific impartiality at the 21st geneticist plenum offended someone's feelings. It turns out that modern genetics is simply not compatible with the tabula rasa philosophy of Nyashinskyism, in which, in a revolutionary state of mind, even the seeds of gooseberry can be converted into figs. With horror, Otomsky discovered that he was titillating himself a small clay worm when speaking in front of the Presidium. Never having written criticisms of himself before, the poor scholar overstrained so blatantly that even in the then lush atmosphere of self-depreciation, it was difficult for those present to listen to his words. Since this memorable performance, Otomsky's name has been associated specifically with the epithet of groveling. Completely compromised as a historical figure, the merciful chairman Nyazinsky decided to spare the memory of an older and once much more dignified comrade and sent him behind a dumpster during the Nine process, then later had all notes of Utomsky's existence removed. However, the historical forgery failed, as the retoucher absent-mindedly left one remarkable photo unprocessed, where Utomsky was still present. The same one where Commissar Julius Kuznitsky had previously disappeared into obscurity. Technically the most impressive, however, is the story of the fall from grace of Ignis Nielsen, a prophet and Mazov school teacher. Despite being a noteworthy figure in the history of the communist movement, he became a disembodied spirit in the hands of the Vasa censors. Mazov's apocalyptic bloodthirsty character suddenly became somehow burdensome for the image of the social democratic Nordic countries. So they concocted Nielsen's disappearance with Grad, following the newly defeated revolution. To the dismay of the censors, dozens of hours of film material were shot of Mazov during the technically advanced 11-day government, where the revolutionary icon was almost always accompanied by his best friend and comrade-in-arms, 
Nielsen. Destroying all the material would have raised suspicions. And so it was that an elliptical gray cytoplasm hovers permanently to Mazov's right. It took historians decades to solve this eerie mystery. Even today, many believe that the cytoplasm is communism itself. Chapter 4 Vidkun Heard A 12 millimeter film is running in the projector. Khan is sitting on a sofa with Machehek looking suspiciously at his square coffee cup on a square plate. He takes a spoon to stir the sugar, approaching the cup cautiously. The café named Cinema is all glass and white. Jesper, who is sitting on a white chair and adjusting the projector, is surrounded by glass soundproof walls. The white canvas falls onto the glass plaque, and the sofa where Khan and Machahak are sitting is also white. In the middle of the cafe's glass vitrine is a statue of an albino tiger. Just be careful not to break anything. It'll cost you dearly. Let me guess. The agent twirls his Astra in his fingers, making it as soft as he likes. Your design? One of my students. This place is like a cinema screen, blank and white, and we are projected here, you know? How is it? It's not comfortable, this screen, you know? It's a bit uncomfortable. Well, he's a bit nervous, yes, but the boy is talented. He needed a high-visibility project, and this is the only place where he can get behind the projector quickly. So let's try to keep an open mind, you know? Jesper and the tiger look at Khan. The glass eyes of the tiger are brighter than the interior designers. Hey, man, I am. Machahek takes a pencil and a notebook out of his jacket pocket. So, Jesper starts, one of my colleague's relatives works as an operator, makes documentaries. Last fall, he told me about his new project with Jessel. Do you know Conrad Jessel? He mainly does crime stuff, right? Not just that. Gerster, that's my operator's name, tells me how scared he is to do it and asks me if he should do it. He has a child now and so on. The thing is, the film is about, and then I became interested. Vidkun heard. Oh my god! I don't want Vidkun heard. Wait, wait, same here. That's been done. He was in Arda, couldn't be in Vasa, and so on. But I decided to keep an eye on him, you know? And then two weeks ago, Gerster came to talk to me. They're on the verge of a breakthrough. Vidkun heard has been in Kronstadt with them for six months. No way! And they have a strategy there to impress her. Giselle likes her. Giselle is Nordic, white as snow, well-read, and a good debater. So Hurd wants to impress the interviewer, start to chat, to brag. Giselle gives the impression that there have been plenty of those wildly imaginative rapists. And what can Vidkun Hurd do? Uh-huh. The first three months, Vidkun just hints, piques curiosity, drops suspicious dates, talks about going to the beach. Giselle doesn't notice, discuss his philosophy with Vidkun, overcoming good and evil. I have it all written down here. Jesper pats the folder on the glass cube table. Then, one day, Hurd has had enough. The man flicks a switch and a small bulb in the projector's heart lights up. I must warn you now, he looks toward Khan. Those of us whose profession doesn't involve ditches and missing children may take some of what Vidkun says to heart. Therese puts a sick spoonful of sugar in his black coffee and pauses for a moment. After a very obvious pause, he plunges his needle-sharp pencil into the pencil sharpener and pretends to busy himself, a bitter grin on his face. Dude, when are you going to get it? Ditches and missing children? That's your subject, too. Okay, Khan, sighs Jesper. Ditches and missing children. That's my subject. Ditches and missing children? Therese abruptly and gleefully raises his sugar-stretched coffee cup in the air and waits. Skull! exclaims Khan. Skull, says Jesper, and scoops a slice of lime out of the water glass. His eyebrow furrowed thoughtfully at the sour taste. He chews on it. Is it deep, Jesper? Oh! A superhuman rapist, child molester, and former member of the NFT fascist party Heimdall, Vidkun heard, appears on the white screen. 
with one hand cuffed to a chair, the other placed gentlemanly on his cheek, the futuristic philosopher is aware of the camera's presence. With this in mind, he raises his Nordic bulldog chin to a certain noble angle. There he glances up and down from his eye sockets, his hair carefully combed to one side in a thirty-year-old manner, and his leg over his knee. You can say that Vidkun is a vain man. Refusing to go down in history in his code-colored prison jumpsuit, he now talks to Conrad Giselle wearing a black shirt's uniform. This was just one of his many conditions. Some people are born posthumously, he brags in the ancient Arda dialect. The archaic verbiage injects plenty of rural charm into his modernly subtle sentiment. The six-digit clock on the table indicates that the third hour of the interview on the 12th of August is underway. Did you know, Vidkun, that I've done a master's thesis in the old Arctic languages? I can smuggle in some literature for you. Oh, that would be most kind of you, Conrad. You know how I feel about the selection in this library. They both murmur as if in understanding. Arda is the inherent language of our tribe, continues Vidkun in a declarative tone. Its vocabulary was adapted and developed by the ancient mammoth hunters who settled Katla Plains thousands of years ago. Arda has a certain semantic advantages in basic matters of wisdom, advantages that continental peoples lack. Arda is our nature, modern-day Vasa, a metropolitan bastard regressed to continental, infiltrated by Grad. This watered-down language is incapable of expressing the truth. All the sentences in this dysgenic compote end up expressing the same thing. International stigma. The next century will see our tribe return to its original language. It will be the birth of a new era in terms of wisdom. You've talked about it quite a lot. I also read your notes on the subject. It's all very interesting, but don't you think that your own historical character is sabotaging the finer points of your doctrine? What? Hurd's eyes suddenly light up. The deep grooves in his cheeks lengthen, and his mouth hardens contemptuously. Conrad pretends not to notice Vidkun's moodiness and continues. While I see the logic in your observations, don't you think it's hard for people to see the scientific validity of it coming from the mouth of a convicted child molester? Mating is an entirely different tradition for our tribe than what modern-day social porn propaganda serves us with its romanticism and I don't know what else. You know this, Conrad. One day, when their impotent morals have led continental peoples to extinction, then you will see what I'm telling you. Well, let's look at it from an ordinary citizen's perspective. An ordinary citizen lets his daughter go to school with blacks and gypsies from childhood in the racial melting pot. An ordinary citizen lets his child be raped there you understand that this is what happens when four girls are put in such a school. Conrad notices what the philosopher muttered under his breath, but he ignores it. The ordinary citizen is one you will consider your reader in the future. The ordinary citizen chooses whether your vision will be put into practice or not. You're talking about the nation. And do you really think he won't notice? The author is a fascist nationalist, a fascist and methodical rapist, with the life sentence in Kronstadt for at least four murders and a book that is a mixture of philosophy, of history, eugenics, and rape. History, history, Conrad. You're a clever man, but your gay education is showing. You still think that history is made with master's theses and I don't know with what. Well, what is it made with? The well-seasoned interviewer doesn't lose his nerve. By raping? Vidkun Hurd grabs a sheet of paper from Giselle's notebook from under his nose. 
A navy blue uniformed soldier jumps into the frame after the sudden movement and strikes the tribesman's wrist with a rubber truncheon. Hurd winces in pain, and the sheet flies into the air. The world-famous documentarian Conrad Giselle, a three-time Oscar Zorn nominee, raises his hand towards the soldier. Although he lowers his truncheon, the soldier stays vigilant beside the man, stroking his wrist. A pen, Vidkun glares angrily at Giselle. With a clenched fist around his writing pen, the detainee throws triumphant glances at the soldier. You! Please give me back my sheet now! The rubber truncheon has already risen menacingly into the air when Giselle quickly tears a new sheet and places it on the steel table in front of Hurd. Do you see now? The crusade! Vidkun's carefully combed hair is in disarray, and a single light brown lock dangles in front of his eyes. With his elbow holding the sheet in place, Hurd tries to put the pen on paper. It seems sharp and dangerous in his hand. The man suddenly gets angry. Please, release my other hand. I can't do it like this. Upon Giselle's pleading gaze, the soldier takes a keychain from his belt. Now, Hurd addresses the viewer directly. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors came here to the edge of the world, to this land. They came here with dog sleds through the tremendous pale. Only the strictest willed creatures maintain their mental integrity during this historic transition. The weak minded continental creatures were left there in the gray void. Our disciplined ancestors simply separated them from the herd, those who lost their minds. And so, only the purified, unwaveringly determined Hakons, Gudruns, and other primogenitors stepped onto the Katla soil from the Grey Crater. Within fifty years, these primogenitors hunted down all the mammoths in Katla. They flourished! Vidkun Hurd stretches his liberated hand victoriously and begins drawing small dots on the sheet of paper. This is a fundamental eugenic law, Conrad, fundamental. The more challenging the environment, the further the human being involves beyond the step wall. Here, in this dark, snowy expanse, man was not meant to live here. Just to survive, a superhuman tendency must emerge. Giselle shrugs with anticipation, not interrupting and nodding understandingly. A superhuman tendency is not limited by moral constraints. A superhuman tendency is not limited by moral constraints. A superhuman tendency is a deliberate desire. Everything is possible for it. Nothing is forbidden. Through blood in the darkness of night, from one winter to another, it is passed down from generation to generation. Even in you, Conrad, there is a superhuman tendency. Conrad nods. Vidkun Hurd's face turns an unhealthy red. The redness is somewhere between fever and an allergic rash. All of us, including you, are obligated to amplify this primordial entity within ourselves. Like the jaws of a predator grow tougher from eating meat. Obligation, obligation to your pack so that they too have big jaws, the kind that can hold a lot of meat. Vidkud admires the artwork with a proud smile that doesn't seem to fit his face. The camera hasn't yet shown exactly what's happening on the page, but Giselle leans in closer to the picture. A rare creature, the middle one, a unique treasure. The projector hums. Jesper takes a laminated copy of Vidkun's paper from the folder and places it on the table. The page carefully maps out an unfamiliar constellation, an elegant constellation of dozens of dots. Khan's mouth drops open in horror. Collaboration Police Agent Therese Machahek calmly makes a note in his notebook. You have no idea, Conrad, how hard I fucked her! You can't imagine! Hurd is still speaking, 
when Jesper hurriedly switches off the projector. June, twenty years ago. It's dusky and chilly on the cliff in the pine forest by the shore. The scorching sun hangs over the tops of the pine trees, but only a few patches of light make it through the interlaced sand and root tangle to reach the forest floor, like golden spots on the ocean floor. For a moment, there is complete silence beneath the trees. From a hundred meters away, you can hear the heather crunching under the approaching boy sneakers until the sea breeze makes pine needles rustle again. The trunks of the trees sway gently, a tangle of dark orange pillars with golden stripes on the sides from the sun. The sweet smell of resin floats in the forest. The dusty taste of chamomile, a sweet and bitter bouquet, lingers in Teresa's nostrils. A match is struck, and thick puffs from the stolen Astra cigarette sweeps all the smells away, a trail of smoke clearly outlined in a single beam of light. Therese relaxes, his windbreaker over his head. He practices making smoke rings in the light. Just a few kilometers away in the town is his father's diplomatic villa. The house, so close to the popular summer beach, made Therese a popular boy three weeks ago at the beginning of summer vacation. Just as footsteps from the others can be clearly heard from behind the hill, Therese blows a small ring through the larger smoke ring. Oh, I did it, he exclaims, ruining his masterpiece. What? Jesper, in shorts and a sailor's shirt, asks as he reaches the hill. What did you do? The smoke ring went through the other one. You're smoking now? asks Jesper, startled. Want some? Astra, it's the strongest. Give me, Therese, I'll have one. Khan, who is panting, comes up beside Jesper. A binocular with a leather strap hangs around Khan's neck. Here! Therese throws the packet towards Khan, who spills some as he fumbles with his hands. In his exhaustion, the boy still manages not to drop it and lifts it under his glasses. Cool! Khan gives the carton a professional assessment. The white stars run there on the blue cardboard. Pointless, Jesper says out of the corner of his mouth, and walks away from Therese to the top of another hill to survey the land. That shirt of yours, well, that's pointless. Therese lazily stands and offers Khan a match out of the matchbox. Jesper squints his eyes and raises his hand like a captain, surveying the forest floor before him. Pointless, yes? Annie didn't think so. You know, she complimented me on it last day. Did she now? Jesper turns to Khan. The boy takes a tentative puff of smoke. Hey, Khan, remember in the dressing room, and he said that was a nice shirt? She did, Therese, she did say that. Felsen jumped in like a fool and told Annie she had a beautiful dress before I could. And something about her hair, too. It was very funny. An opportunity to be polite is never missed, Khan announces with a smile, coughing up some smoke. Let's go. Three boys move through the patches of light, sliding under the trees toward the top of the slope. Khan throws away his cigarette with a failed flick and starts twirling his binoculars on the string. His backpack shakes as he accelerates downhill. Running down the slopes, the other boys jump over the heather bushes. Only Jesper worries about his white pants and strolls dignifiedly with his hands in his pockets, like on an evening walk. The sound of the ocean in the trees grows louder as they approach their usual spot on the cliff. The wooden fence has signs of danger of collapse, where the small piece of slope is falling down. Crossing the pedestrian road and climbing into the bushes from under the sign, Khan explains to Therese. Look, they call it the North Sea, but it's actually an ocean. Theoretically, it extends into your Igressi Sea, through the Pale. It reaches Grad. This makes the North Sea intersolar, so it's actually an ocean. A question of classification. Together for the third week, the three of them try to keep their conversation as academic as possible, to impress everyone with their intellectual character when they return in the fall. Jesper, slipping carefully through the bushes behind, continues, We didn't have a word for the ocean in Kadla. Everything was just sea. 
A huge aquamarine body of water expands in front of the boys from the high cliff edge. The clouds tear apart in the pale blue sky, and the bright white sun reflects as a stripe on the water below. The ocean waves lazily and majestically wash along the long sandy strip. Charlotte's y'all. The wind disappears for a moment, and a blast of heat hits the boys' faces. Insects emerge from the foliage of flowering wild primroses. The shore curves towards the sea under a rocky cliff. All the way to the tip of the peninsula where Hav San Glory Hotel is located. There are small human dots on the sand with red and white striped beach umbrellas. The boys sit on a patch of grass among thorns where the steep sandy cliff disappears from view. Therese has theorized several times about how one could theoretically jump down this soft rocky slope. He would land on a gently sloping sand dune from a height of three meters and then slide on his heels. Jesper worries about his clothes in such a case, and Khan is simply a coward. Even now, Therese sits closest to the edge, while Jesper begs Khan for the binoculars. The sunspots reflect on the curved insect eyes of the binoculars. In the dark, cool heart of the glasses, the picture of people down on the beach, northern summer tourists with their towels and umbrellas, is magnified. The image is even clearer for Khan, who adjusts his left plus seven, right plus four prescription lenses. Khan bought the binoculars with his own money from Vasa in a shop for hunters. When Jesper has scanned the beach, it's Therese's turn. With rubber cushions pressed into his eye socket and his cheeks increasingly freckled from the sun, he admits, Not yet. It's only ten o'clock. They'll come. While Khan and Therese compare cigarette brands, Vasa crap is said to be mild, while the decent stuff from Grad is more potent, Khan nods eagerly at everything. Meanwhile, Jesper aims his sniper scope at the beach, refusing to give up. A small cross stops at a white beach umbrella, but does not find the red flowers it is looking for. Vertical lines move across young families, collapsing sandcastles and brown-skinned sunbathers, stopping on two blonde girls for a moment before continuing. It's not them. Jesper adjusts his focus. From about 200 meters away, a faint familiar feeling stirs in his heart. A distant constellation, a material communion. He waves his hand to signal to the boys that something is happening. Khan and Therese shield their eyes from the sun and look down at the beach. Refining the focus of his Zeul brand lenses, the pale pink veil sharpens into a stomach in Jesper's eyes. Breathing shakes the eyepieces from the girl's navel up to the solar plexus, where the curves of her chest gather in a ring holding her tanning top. White ribbons cut into her shoulders, and her breasts rise and fall under the fabric as she breathes. The wheel in the center of the binoculars clicks twice, and the expanded field of view settles on the beige beach towel as the girl turns on her stomach. A flash of ash-blonde hair and familiar round cheeks beneath sunglasses. Annie Aylin Lund lazily props herself up on her elbows and buries her head in a girl's magazine. Above her small backside, an oddly delicate constellation of birthmarks runs down her spine, extending to the wings of her shoulder blades. Cool horror seeps through the seals of the window into the cafe cinema, where three minds try to maintain their surface tension of coping for the twentieth year. Khan shrugs his shoulders. Who knows this? Who knows? I haven't read a single line about it in all this time. It's said nowhere. Therese puts his pencil on the table. This is a control fact. It is deliberately left out of personal descriptions, even from official documentation. I have those thirty folders in my head, and there isn't a single line about it. He knows it. Look at him. Jesper's face remains unchanged. He's already been through this. That's why Gustav came to me. The officials just shrugged their shoulders. Maybe he heard at work that I knew the girls. 
They were all confused there. Her didn't explain more either. And by the way, I don't believe that crap. Some boys were there for principle, but Hurd actually likes big-breasted good ones. It doesn't fit the profile. It's not chronologically possible, Con livens up. He was 600 kilometers away, five hours earlier, buying crankshafts and gaskets for his damn rake machine. I don't know, some kind of gasket plugs. Because of the noise of the infamous rake machine's construction, Vidkun Hurd's neighbors finally called the police on him, and that was the beginning of his end. Inayat Khan, however, looked seriously into the eyes of the collaboration police agent. Therese, you have to reopen the case now. Continue the investigation. Somehow he has to know, and it's the only credible lead since the stuff with the letters. You have to do it. You can't imagine how bad things are right now. It's the worst time to dig old things up. There's no more support in the military. Everything is in a semi-state of war. No one knows if Orandiarik still exists. They'll fire me if I start this mess again. No, Therese, you have to do something about it. Jesper, now slightly annoyed, isn't interested in a looming world war. You're the only one who does this. It's your job. Do it. Wait, now wait. Of course I'll take it on. I had the feeling from the beginning when you invited me to the class reunion. Did you think I thought you were nostalgic or something? My own case is always open. You know, that folder doesn't close. You just have to hope the locals will go along quietly. They all hate cooperating. Very rarely does anyone bother to check if any of the interrogation papers have been signed. Khan smiles cunningly. Interrogation papers? So you're still going to Kronstadt? Tomorrow. Good to know you're still cool, Therese. Jesper also smiles, a little uncomfortably due to his reddening cheeks and pressing tone. But cool indeed. That's good then. Therese agrees. It's a very good thing. Twenty years. There shouldn't be any hope left by then. But there is hope. Jesper intelligently tilts his still too large head for his shoulders. Yes, very good, Jesper. You've been very good. Check, please. The interior designer, who has been out of the active business for the last two years, snaps his fingers at the waiter and points his index finger to the table. The evenings haven't been easy for him, but today is different. Tonight, Jesper can afford himself little treats, little foolish treats. The night arrives outside the cube's windows, in the dark, where anything is possible. It's possible to find them somewhere inside a hidden corner of this world, from the eternal ice of Lace Vostok, or from the Urg Desert, where remote Kar's eyes disappeared without a trace, deep in the lungs of Grod. You can still find them, as they were then, small, and through that, become small yourself. Above the clouds, at the foot of Corpus Mundi, you just have to lift the veil of raindrops a little, and you can touch them. You were so brave not to give up. Everyone else forgot about us. The night sky was dotted with cold stars. The dark blue dome of the sky spun above our heads, but we knew you were still looking for us. Chapter 5 Za Um Ani Aelin Lund takes off her sunglasses and is blinded by a sudden flash of light. A crimson-blue swirl of color in the girl's irises splashes onto her pupils, and the smoky eye makeup glints in the sunlight. Ani's little head turns swiftly like a kitten's. A sun bunny hops from a girl's magazine to sand, from sand to sunshade, as the girl's eyes follow it. What's going on? Therese asks, dangling his legs on the edge of the cliff. I don't know. Malin's there now, too. She's standing. That's what I can see from here, that she's standing, interrupts Khan impatiently. She stands there, and I have to admit, that red-dotted swimsuit doesn't look too bad on her. It's a two-piece, and it's a trend now, and... Oh, she's just... Damn! Marlin's smile through the binoculars turns into a smirk, and there's a glint of malicious glee in her eyes. 
Her hand rises to wave demonstratively above her head. The picture disappears as Jesper hides the treacherous lenses under his belly. Down! Everyone on the ground! Khan hears the blood rushing in his ears and feels a throb in his arm, his body halfway inside a thorny rosehip bush. Therese, who simply threw himself quickly on his back, now looks up at the pale June sky. A solitary eagle glides high above. It seems as if the bird is just hanging in the air. Khan, look, an eagle. What fucking eagle? Ow! The rosehip bush reminds Khan of its presence sharply. Don't wiggle, you're rustling the bush, Jesper grumbles from the middle, lying on his stomach with binoculars in hand. Well, if they've already seen us, then it doesn't make much difference whether I rustle the bush or not. Hey, look what they're doing. Look for yourself, Jesper slides the binoculars to Khan. The bush rustles as Khan, wearing a loose summer shirt, crawls out of it with his binoculars in hand. He raises his head and tries to stay invisible behind the tall grasses. Hurriedly, he moves the binoculars down the beach to the parasol with red flowers and stomps on the beach towel. To his surprise, he only sees little Madge sitting and looking ahead. Sweat drops onto Khan's glasses as he starts to worry. Forebodingly, he moves his gaze closer to the rock at the bottom until the little opera glasses are only about a hundred meters away, staring straight into his lenses. Standing there, with one hand on her hip, is the slender Charlotte, eldest of the sisters, with her auburn hair flowing in the wind. This beautiful and terrifying creature from the ninth grade is about as far away from Khan's immigrant grasp as a seat in the parliament. And now she's so close that even without Malin's operetta glasses, her gaze pierces Khan's miserable eyes. Eyes that he now hides rather than amplify with his binoculars. Good Lord, they've got some little binoculars with them, Khan informs the emergency meeting. That's what they were pointing at yesterday. I know, I should have told you. What, Therese? Jesper suddenly gets angry. So they know, and you let us walk straight into a trap just now. I forgot, sorry. I thought they may be watching that eagle. You know, its nest is right near the cliff, too. You can stick that eagle up your ass. Khan laughs hard as this as Jesper continues. Now all we have to do is stand up and wave at them, and that's it. I don't know what we're going to say about this ship show with the binoculars. I really don't know. I have an idea. Therese stands up determinedly, while Khan grabs him by the trousers. Soon, however, the three slender girls, huddled up on the beach below, see a scrawny, blond-haired boy, and then, a moment later, the slightly overweight boy from Il Mara, awkwardly step up beside Therese. Hello, girls! Therese exclaims. Malin gasps and covers her mouth as the tall, straight figure leaps down from the bank as high as a four-story building. Next morning, twenty years later, the tired lines from the man's eyes curve around his cheekbones. Under his eyes are two sharp peaks like those of a bird of prey. Grooves on either side of his cheeks. Wait. Worry. The blinds in the collaboration police offices have long been drawn on his arbitrarily colored eyes. No one can look into them and see what's happening behind the curtains. The collaboration police agent also has a freshly trimmed beard that extends slightly forward, a long gray neck, tired skin from smoking resting against a white dress shirt. A thin black tie hangs from the collar of his shirt. The overnight rain has stopped, but it is still cold and windy. With his left hand, he pulls his collar closer and smokes with his right. Standing like this, in the bow of a small border patrol ship, a young Vasa officer next to Therese, steaming cup of coffee in his hand, asks, What's in Kronstadt? Unfortunately, I cannot answer that question, mutters Therese mechanically. His eyes are fixed on the autumn horizon. A flock of seagulls rises from the reeds of the harbor and screams over the cold water as the boat engine starts with a clatter, a whiff of fuel and a chemical rainbow in the water. Coffee? The young man tries to pick up the conversation again. No, thank you. Therese feels droplets of water on his face. Refreshing. The low gray sky has no sun to be seen this morning, only airship lights circling above the city. And the steel silhouette of the large, 
Grodd cruiser hangs in the bay like a ghost. Jarnspurken, they call them, iron ghosts. Nobody likes those ominous ships here. Encounters with ghosts. On guard, yes, but against whom? Who has declared war on whom? Nobody. And Grodd, with its steel umbrella, won't win any hearts here. And even Therese, who looks like an ordinary northerner, but speaks and smokes like a Grodd man, can't get far with his talk of Motherland Ziemsk, the hundred-year occupation, and the Yugo Grodd massacre. Yes, and also Frantichek the Brave. Of course, he wanted to be like Frantichek the Brave. Still does. All the Koikos want to be like Frantichek the Brave. Occupy positions, rise up, hoist the flags of Sigismund the Great again. Boldness, joie de vivre like a thundering troika. What happened? A solitary border patrol boat is making its way across the North Sea. The waves rock the boat heavily, and soon Therese has to throw away his cigarette so as to not slip on the deck. The poor smoking conditions make shivering outside pointless, so he goes to sit on a cabin bench. He tries not to look towards the city, down the winding coastline where Charlotte's Yaw is located. Oh, how he longs to go there. One time he came here, 4,000 kilometers from Grodd on the pale magnet train, didn't even call Khan or Jesper, went straight to Charlotte's Yaw, and just sat there like an idiot. Then he went back home, another week through the pale. He and Jesper were still fighting over the restaurant thing, and just hanging out with Khan seemed pointless too. That was his winter solstice holiday two years ago. That was his vacation. The department psychiatrist banned him from traveling for a year. It was deemed dangerous to go through the pale so often. With a tourniquet in his mouth, Majahek pierces the clearly visible vein on his wrist with a glass and metal syringe. But he still wants to see how the reeds bend in the wind. It's so beautiful to watch the ocean gently and calmly washing up on the beach. Somewhere in the distant haze, there is the silhouette of a rocky cliff, and the water, cold water, raindrops. It's beautiful to watch. Therese's veiny hands lovingly stroke the black suitcase in his lap. Hadramut Karsai! shouts little Inayat Khan from the edge of the cliff and jumps. The sun shines. His belly tingles as if he has a hundred meters to go, but the fall lasts only a moment. Suddenly, his feet hit the sand. For a few seconds, he kicks his heels into the sand and the slide slows. Little Khan feels the roots poke his buttocks and the rocks scrape on his back, his shirt coming out of his trousers. His glasses bounce off his face and a cheering freckled Therese rushes to catch them underneath. The girls run toward his battered body. You're crazy, exclaims Ani. There's a reason to cheer, but not little Jesper. He's now alone up there and staring at the cliff, his white trousers, his sailor shirt, and then the cliff again. No, he purses his lips, packs the backpack left behind by Khan, and takes the long way through the forest. He strides at the quickest pace possible, which is not yet an undignified trot. From the pine-clad footpath, the boy turns on the suspension bridge between the two rises and then descends the steps onto the boardwalk on the other side. The journey to the beach seems to go on forever. Already he thinks with horror of the nonsense that stupid Khan must be spouting. How is he supposed to play along with it uncoordinated now? It's only half an hour before Jesper reaches the beach below and stands helplessly beside the girl's empty beach towels. Excuse me, you didn't happen to see where the boys who jumped down from there went? He points to the cliff in the background. The old man was asked to watch the girl's things. Jesper decides that wherever they are, they can't take long. After a moment of basking in the hot sun, he sits down on the beach towel with flowers. After debating whether he should take his shirt off, it's getting hot, he decides to be tasteful and lays down on the towel as cool as possible. The coolness of it lies in the indifferent position in which his arms are crossed under his head. Jesper is more interested in the clouds now. 
He is deep in thought now. He's thinking. And then his nose is hit with a minuscule atomic unit of perfume. Lilies of the valley, breath and human skin, dissolve before his eyes. Jesper turns his head, and across the beige plain of the beach he sees it. A world of fragrant, alien, girly things. There are white and pale summer dresses with ties folded so terribly neatly, little belts and useless knick-knacks. Ani's exquisite bracelet, and in the weaved baskets there is just the kind of food girls like. Jesper can't seem to remember any of it, but there certainly isn't much of it. Girls don't like to eat. That much Jesper knows. In a foolish fascination, he raises his hand for the little bottle protruding from the small bag. The perfume bottle is shaped like a pomegranate. The golden liquid behind the raspberry-colored glass flows and Jesper watches in fascination. The world disappears. Still holding the bottle, he doesn't even understand why, but his hand surreptitiously puts the little hair tie back into the breast pocket of his sailor suit. He throws himself on his back again and looks at the sun through the glass of the bottle. For a brief moment, he is in the raspberry red world of the pomegranate, when suddenly, as if out of nowhere, Charlotte's long legs loom over him. Little Madge looks him straight in the eye from Teresa's shoulders. What's he doing with your bottle, Annie? The fiery synapses in Jesper's head begin to make connections as soon as the spell is broken, and he doesn't let a casual surprise appear on his face. Revacholier, he pronounces succulently, and then finishes like an old pro himself. Granat, number three, very good choice, strong notes, natural. Juniper gives a kind of airy go. No, very good choice. What can I say? Yours, Annie? Jesper sits up quietly and undisturbed. Khan and Therese look excitedly in the direction of the girls, especially Annie, who licks a lime ice cream with a smile. Mine, yes, she says, a little snippy at first, then becoming more polite. Your mother's a perfumer, isn't she? It's more like importing than producing, lately. But she's got papers and stuff. You know, I've been to the Revachol perfume factory to see how Cronat is distilled. You've been to Revachol? Even Charlotte is impressed. She's something of a goddess at school, a grade above with her expensive clothes and high school boys. And now the goddess's eyes go wide with surprise. Jesper's ears turn flaming red. Once, yes, my mother's colleagues invited her on a tour. Therese, who had been holding the flag oh so high, thinks that now that the greater danger is over, Jesper should be brought back down to earth. So that's why you smell like a flower. Little Madge on Therese's shoulder laughs uproariously at everything the boy says. He was lucky. Therese would never have guessed he was some kind of child magnet, but that adventurous leap has already kept him afloat for three quarters of an hour. Khan is completely useless. He manages to catch every third of Therese's bait, but then he doesn't know what to do with it and just mumbles. Ani sits next to flushed Jesper. I think Jesper smells good. Not at all like socks or that dressing room. It's quite horrible, says Malin mildly. Honestly, it's all Van Fersen, Khan now scores his first point. Fersen has these P.E. socks. It's not normal the way they smell. Therese breathes a sigh of relief. The queue for ice cream was already quite long. Neither Khan nor Therese are the best wordsmiths in an emergency, and Therese's plan was to avoid the topic at any cost until Jesper arrives. Luckily, Madge came to the rescue and demanded to be on Therese's shoulders, and her constant chatter made everybody laugh. Therese now feels that it's time to finally address the issue. He lifts Madge off his shoulders and glances suggestively towards Jesper, mentioning casually, You took the things with you, right? Cigarettes? Binoculars? Ani Aylin doesn't fall for the cigarettes. What was that binoculars thing you had there? We already saw something flashing all the time yesterday. Like a little mirror. It was exciting. Uh, just bird watching. You know, there's a pair of sea eagles nesting there. Therese barely manages to start, when Malin grins maliciously. Bird watching. Ani giggles next to Jesper, and Charlotte, the wicked goddess, is even sharper. Yes, bird watching is indeed popular with gentlemen these days. 
Jesper is bright red, but in the deep crevice of Machahek's freckled face, Frantichek the Brave lifts his gallant head. It's about time. He rushes towards Therese, throwing caution to the wind towards the brightest and most unlikely prize, as is customary for us, the filthy Koikos, all or nothing. Golabetsko moya, Therese Machahek says with a charming smile. Well, maybe we saw even rarer birds. So often, all or nothing means nothing for us filthy Koikos. But not on that day. On that hot, sunny day, twenty years ago, Charlotte. Her rounded shoulders move forward, her clavicles stand out. Under the arches of her eyebrows, cold green eyes light up with a smile, like the light of a distant star. For Therese, it says, Chance. Therese is so happy. Everything is going so well. Shadows grow, hours pass, and the white sand turns yellow, then orange and striped with shadows. The girls take the beach towels on their shoulders, and little Madge yawns and falls asleep under a blanket. The wind dies down. It becomes quiet. A kingdom. Horse-drawn trams roll in the distance. Their tracks screech, distant music from someone's yard. The beach empties, and the sky turns into a blue, violent gradient. Therese tells the girls about his father's diplomatic villa, plans for the summer, and about the next day. Dressing cabins stand upright and cast shadows on the beach like clock hands. Strips of clouds rise above the smooth water, their curdled lilac bellies, the cyan, magenta, and cooled deep orange of the horizon. Malin tries on Khan's glasses. Khan can't see anything behind Malin's large black sunglasses. Only the girl's shapes flicker like upside-down candle flames. Bring some apple cider, Annie Aylin shouts as the tram door closes. Four pale horses jerk from their place. The cabin shines yellow in the evening twilight, and little Madge, with angel wings and a white dress, sleeps on Malin's lap. A fairy godmother's magic wand falls from her hand onto the cabin's sandy floor. Three boys stand at the tram stop making gasping faces at each other as the tram turns around the corner and disappears from sight. The warm, sour breath makes the white hotel linen flutter against the linoleum salesman's mouth. Linoleum salesman, linoleum salesman, linoleum salesman. With his left hand on his nape, he pulls the double loop of linen around his neck into a knot. The knot is intricate and extremely well tied. The eighth floor balcony door is still cracked and cool air is seeping into the Havsanglar room. From the balcony, there is a magnificent view down to the late evening beach. On the reed floor of the balcony, the telescope with a reflector box mounted in protective paint is dismantled from its base. Scout model. Behind the telescope is a modified camera. On the balcony, and only on this balcony, not in the adjoining room or the hallway, because that's not the way the linoleum salesman likes these things. So it's only on this balcony here that he hears the intense breathing of evil. Twenty years later, in the evening, Vidkun Hurd stares at a distressed collaboration police agent in front of the barred window of the interrogation room. Despicable. Hurd wears his gray prison jumpsuit. On the reflective strip is written Vidkun Hurd and his number with an alphabetical abbreviation. The agent peels off his jacket and carelessly throws it down in front of the window. The shirt has sweat stains under the armpits. The agent's movements are uncoordinated. On the chest of the shirt is a freshly printed badge with the visitor's identification code. The fan hums. Hey, you're drunk! Vidkun glances over his shoulder at the sergeant on guard at the door. The smell of booze is getting to my head. Please get me out of here. I'm not in the mood. Vidkun smirks as he listens to snippets of Machahek's conversation with the correctional officer. Five minutes, ten minutes, a child's life is at stake. 
The door closes behind the guard, and a key of dubious construction flashes briefly in Therese's hand. Ma-che-heck, Vidquin pronounces. You're a koiko. You're like a Grodian mutt, some kind of two-tiered life form. Both herds' arms and legs are cuffed this time, the massive irons bending his arms uncomfortably behind his back. But despite this, he somehow sits like a nobleman. You lied. Who did you get the drawing from? Teresa's eyes are bleary, and the man blinks angrily. Listen, have you heard about that study on eugenics that praises the humble mind of the Koikos? Who did you get the drawing from, pig? A scholar, you know, recommends mating your kind with blacks. Super workers. Shut up! Therese pulls down the steel curtains on the interrogation room windows. Abruptly, the blinds fall with a rattle, and immediately there's the sound of the correctional officer's nervous jingling of keys in the lock. Idiot, do you want to go to jail or something? We're following the declaration here. We do not have some kind of grod anarchy. In the windowless room, in the clean iron light of the hall, Therese Machahek is standing next to a desk, unpacking his briefcase. The lining inside of it fits exactly one iron box, and on the box, in white letters, is written, Za-Um. Hurd's eyes widen in fear. There is pounding from behind the door. You don't have a permit for this. You must have a permit. Show me your permit. What did you say? I can't hear you. Some pig is squealing all the time. Therese hits Hurd in the face with the iron box. Blood pours on the gray prison jumpsuit. Hurd whines and a small speck of white bone is visible on his nose. The man faints. Muffled threats can be heard behind the door but Therese's diamond key rattles in the lock. I am International Collaboration Police Agent Therese Machehek, Mirova, Grad. I have the legal right to interrogate, and if you mess with that door again... The knocking stops for a moment, and Zaum clicks open. Everything happens quickly and skillfully, one could say. Therese pulls out the yellowed tubing with hanging canulas from the foam cushion of the box, fashions the grotesque bellows-like device around his wrist with a belt, and pulls the rubber hose taut around Vidkun Hurd's iron-clad arm. Slightly swaying, he screws the hose onto the device and then sticks the needle into Vidkun's vein. A small red drop of Hurd's superhuman tendency flows directly into the canula. Running steps can be heard from behind the steel curtain window and heavy boots on the prison floor. Reinforcements. The lid of the device clicks open on Machahek's wrist. A row of vials appears, filled with yellow liquid, like dentures with cigarette smoke under the lip. A smile stretched without expression. A quiet hiss, and the first vial clicks into place. The bellows on top of the lid tremble for a moment, and then the device on Machahek's wrist starts to breathe quietly like a pet. The yellow urine-colored liquid pumps into Vidkun Hurd's wrist. He opens his eyes and starts wheezing in panic. Do you know what this is, fucking hog? Therese hisses between his teeth, light in front of Vidkun's swollen face. A little blood and saliva splash from the man's mouth onto Machahek's face as he rolls his eyes in fear and cries, I lied. You are right. I have never seen them. My cellmate. I don't care what you think. I don't think anything. I'm telling you. I had a cellmate several years ago. Derek... I don't care what you think. I want your truth. Therese's eyes are bulging terribly. He snatches the gag from Vidkun's arm, and the vein, swollen with mescaline and lysergic acid, visibly shrinks. Suddenly, Vidkun clenches his teeth so tightly that they seem as if they will break at any moment. You can't have anything from me. Now you can't get anything from me, he splutters madly. I'm so strong. The battering ram can be heard from behind the door. I love that you think so. It's best if you think so. Therese pants, screwing another canula onto the apparatus. It's for him. Eyes fixed on the wrist. He jabs the needle into his vein. 
The first vial is empty, the next to Rhee's shares with Vidkun, excitedly spluttering against his mouth. It's a mincing machine. You can't imagine how hard I'm going to fuck you with it now. The pissed yellow liquid breaks through Vidkun's blood-brain barrier, and on his head, under his skull, a huge pressure builds like a bubble of air. The man's face clenched between his hands. Therese begins to scream. His voice reaches Hurd's head like white noise, pure, bellowing violence. I'll make a cretin of you, do you feel? Vidkun's scalp gives in to the pressure of the agent's hands and cracks open like a flower bloom. It feels like something is being born from it. Vidkun's handcuffs rattle helplessly. The man tries to hold the substance that is bursting out of his head with his hands. Pieces of his brain still fall from his fingers to the floor. He can't. It's too slippery. There's too much of it. I can see your cunt! You're open in front of me! I'm going to open you up! Therese pants, watching the whole of Vidkun herd open up in front of him. The man trembles under the sharp fingers of the agent and tries with all his might to say, to tell him what he is looking for, to say it in human language, but his mouth no longer works. And all this time, as Therese wades through his head like a tiger in water, Vidkun sees only one picture reflected back at him from Therese's mirror. On that cool surface, where Vidkun escapes from the devastating slaughter in his own head, Charlotte Loon's dark green eyes look at him. Deep inside the pupils, the chance given to Therese shimmers. It is so beautiful and infinitely sad when Therese collapses from exhaustion behind the interrogation table, Vidkun begins to cry. The Vasa coastline sparkles before him, and the nightly waves break against the hull of the border guard ship at his feet. A yellowish dome of light shines above the city in the distance. It seems indescribably joyful. All those white and yellow lights in the city fit in Therese's hand. And even though it is cold outside, he is not wearing a coat. His jacket flaps open, and Vidkun Hurd's blood splatters are still on his white dress shirt. The hands of the collaboration police agent are comfortably handcuffed, and a young officer helps him stand on the deck. What mischief did you do there? asks the officer. If I wrote you a symphony, sounds a crackling voice from the transistor radio. Hey, thanks for letting me out. It was a beautiful evening. Okay, the officer begins to laugh quietly. Could you turn up the volume on that song? What? I promise I won't jump overboard. Turn it up. I'm more worried you'll fall overboard, but okay then. The officer steps into the ship's cabin and onto the deck. Over the noise of the waves and the engine, a massive beat and the man's falsetto say, If I wrote you a symphony to show you how much you mean to me. Therese's foot starts tapping. With the same relief he only feels after using za Un. He sighs to the officer. You know, I just saw the disappearance of the Lund children. What? You don't know? It's very famous. When was that? Oh, a long time ago. You weren't even born yet. But it doesn't matter. It feels so good right now. I think I solved it, Therese laughs. It's a dark laugh, but genuine, very genuine. And the night over the North Sea laughs back at him. Chapter 6 Frantichek the Brave Sometimes the saddest disappearance is the one that remains unresolved. Before it became a hydroelectric power station, the Paramenaya Vera was just the Vera River, into which the operetta star Nadia Harnankur threw herself at the height of her popularity. It could have stayed that way. Nadia simply vanished after one autumn evening after a thrilling performance, her heavenly soprano still echoing in the opera house. Was the old man right who claimed to have seen her walking across the bridge in her evening gown? Or was it the fanatical admirer who insisted he'd met her a year later in Revachol? Perhaps there is some truth in the paranoid pulp novelist's tale, 
in which Nadia is actually a mesque spy, nihilist, and a doomsday prophet. Who can say for certain? But one thing is certain. No one needed to see Nadia's remains emerging from the mud of the reservoir in her evening gown. No one needed to see the colony of river mussels in her eye sockets, the dead grin of her golden teeth, or the shocked expressions of the hydroelectric power station construction crew. Futility. Futility shapes the world. History is a story of futilities. Progress is a sequence of futilities. Development, says the futurist. Loss, says the rebel. Hangover, shouts the moralist from the back row. Failure, says the angry rebel. Time is gray, he says. The creator's failure is an introduction to the era. Kras Mazov shoots himself in the head, and Abedanez takes poison with Dobrev in the Ozone Islands. The winds blow sand over their bones under the palm trees. Who was supposed to know? Good people from all over the world came together. Teachers, writers, and migrant workers huddle in trenches. Young soldiers desert their units. What beautiful songs they sing! Brave children are history's favorites, so it seems to them, and they wave white flags with silver-horned crowns. And they lose. Coups are crushed. Anarchists are piled into mass graves on the great blue. Communists, beaten back from the Isola of Grad, retreat to Samara and become a degenerate worker state ruled by bureaucrats. The disappearance of revolutionary lovers is resolved 35 years later when the hugging skeletons of Abedanez and Dobrev are found on the shore of an unnamed Ozon island by Riche Le Pomme's eight-year-old son Eugene during a Saturday evening outing. Wearing shorts and a butterfly net, he stands and looks perplexedly at the bones of his past as they cling together. Faded and smooth. Where does one begin and the other end? Time has mixed them up like a deck of cards. Afterwards, Riche erects a hotel there, along with a now world-famous health center. But the greatest failure is not how Mazov's global revolution ended in bloodshed and then defeat, nor how the bones of revolutionary lovers are now displayed in an aromatherapy waiting room. With internal unrest suppressed, Grad becomes a world power, a giant nation, its cities thriving, and the light of this growth shining like a sparkling network from orbit. Whole nations disappear from the map of the world. Nations where Mazov once had many supporters. Nations like Ziemsk. Nations whose peoples are derogatorily referred to as Koikos. And this goes on for so long that eventually they even begin to call themselves that. Therese Machahek is seven years old. His father is a model Koiko, a diplomat, and a usurper bootlicker who has not yet taken him to school in Vasa. The city is a zone of ecological catastrophe, a post-megapolis and pre-necropolis human settlement in the penultimate stage of development. Polyfabricate spreads out at the border of Ziemsk and Yugo. The monster engulfs Ziemsk's historic centers, Ferdidirk's royal old town and Lenka's pine parks. Summer begins, and in the dimness of the cellars, a name is whispered. Children shouted in the courtyards of the houses. The leaves of the trees rustle on the quiet street, an only echo of that name that resounds in the ear of the Grad militiaman. Frantichek the Brave, the bravest of the Koikos, a movie star, a revolutionary. It was just recently that the riots were brutally suppressed in the spring, and now nothing has been heard of him for two months. It is said that he lurks far away in the taiga, in the Yakut Reserve, and acquires special abilities from the indigenous priests. Fantastic things! His step-eagle cheekbones and yearning gaze, gentle smile as if the sun were rising above the taiga. 
a smile he saves only for those rare occasions when his serious eyebrows are furrowed with worry. His daring face appears in forbidden films in the Jersey factory, where women are brave, sewn onto white cloth from tank tops and panties. No, Franticek the Brave is in Samara, negotiating. He is coming with the forces of the People's Republic. Don't be naive. Franticek is far away, in the Kola, in Winter's orbit, in Ignis Nielsen's hut. They'll never find him. Quiet! Franticek the Brave wouldn't hide. Just yesterday he was seen in line to buy meat. He now has a false beard and a butcher's apron. He called himself Vozan Sark. Read it backwards. But the months pass and no news comes. And soon it's autumn. Industrial dust falls like a mourning veil on the golden and red leaves. In October, a completely different story begins to circulate in Ziemsk. Quiet and timid. Franticek the Brave was shot behind a dumpster. <laughs>